Thanks again um, to uh, the organizers, Alex and Ivan and Axel, for inviting me and um, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my research work, um, trying to establish a link between ind individual electric fields and um, human transcranial electric stimulation application in um, cognitive and, new and, and clinical neuroscience. Um, no, it's not moving forward. No, I have nothing to declare so far. Um, okay, so first I will present some examples for levels of um, test effects we usually assess in clinical and cognitive neuroscience to give a brief introduction into the different attempts to quantify individual responsiveness. <clears throat> Second, uh, this responsiveness can be correlated to electric field quantifications um, we obtain from computational modeling. I will present a study where we tried to disentangle the um, contributors from head and brain anatomy. And third, I will talk about our observations of links between e-fields and empirical test effects. And finally, I'll present an idea how um, the magnitude of electric fields can be estimated if individual MR images are not present, as we can, as we can have uh, the case in clinical contexts, for, for instance. Okay. Um. Okay, so before um, I talk about field uh, simulation studies, I want to briefly show what are the typical study designs we use in clinical and cognitive neuroscience. We usually use brain imaging techniques um, or behavioral performance to assess the effects of TDCS on a group level. Whether a subject responded to tests or not on an individual level um, actually has been more or less neglected in the past and only recently started to arouse the interest of um, clinical neuroscientists. So, for example, um, we did an interest scanner study with TDCS over M1 and 24 young participants to study the effects um, on GABA levels and resting state um, functional connectivity within motor networks. We found that after a nodal TDCS, um, GABA levels were decreased. Um, indicating GABAergic neuroplasticity due to a nodal TDCS. For resting state fMRI, functional connectivity within um, the motor network was higher during a nodal uh, and cathodal TDCS compared to sham. And um, in order to quantify individual responses, we can, for instance, use the difference between a nodal and sham conditions. In this study, this may seem quite intuitive, but um, obviously uh, still some variables may have to be considered, uh, such as order of simulation conditions. Um, I will be talking about this in a little more detail. Um, this is just uh, also to illustrate that, uh, however, clinical designs are often much more complex. Here is just an example of a, a clinical trial um, where we have a lot of measurement time points. We have a lot of imaging parameters. We also have a lot of behavioral tasks. For instance, here we performed a multi-session TDCS study with nine sessions of TDCS and cognitive training over three weeks and pre-post assessment of training task performance, near and far transfer tasks and MR imaging, um, including resting state and diffusion um, tensor imaging. This is just an example also to show you that it's not that easy always to find the parameter we want to correlate then with our modeling. As for the Sorry, as for the behavioral results, uh, we found no difference between groups and the train task. So here's the simulation group and here's the STEM um, group. Um, it was a letter updating task, but we found a small effect, again, the simulation and STEM uh, group um, on a near transfer task, which was an NBEC task here, indicating improved performance levels in TDCS compared to STEM groups uh, after the intervention. Uh, with this benefit persisting for one month, but not for seven months. Um, so here was the seven months follow-up. Um, 
So why I'm telling you all this, um, in general, this challenge of quantifying individual responsiveness is not unique for the aim to correlate it with modeling parameters. It may be um, just important to think about um, these kind of details. For example, is, is a significant behavioral effect on a group level necessary? Or is it maybe the non-existent group effect that can be explained by modeling? For instance, many modeling studies correlate the electric field with parameters that showed a significant difference between active and sham simulation um, in a group of participants. But it is conceivable that e-fields are especially useful when there is no group effect. However, for interpretation of the direction, it is necessary to understand what effects are expected. For instance, in um, young adults, we find an increase in resting state connectivity. I just showed you, while for older adults, we find a decrease. Also, it is not clear yet if there is a certain threshold we want to achieve, such as 5% improvement or decrease in GABA, or particularly a particular myelomole per liter or like. Or do we expect, expect just linear relationships with, um, uh, with field strengths? Further, I think it is important to carefully reflect the re respective experimental design of experiments <clears throat> in clinical neuroscience in order to account for multiple assessment, order effects, baseline effects. So it's not just simply correlating some difference with um, some e-field. And finally, it may be a good idea to use um, the actual electrode configuration instead of standard positions if possible. Uh, for instance, here we had images during TDCS and were thus able to model the exact position and rotation of each um, electrode in each subject and in each condition. Okay. So in order to understand what field simulation could potentially do for us, we wanted to describe e-field distributions in different age groups and um, their link to anatomy of the brain and the head. Uh, we modeled six different electrode configurations, usually applied in clinical and cognitive neuroscience experiments. We extracted the general e-field strength, which we defined as 75th percentile of field magnitude and the field within the potential targeted region of interest of each electrode configuration. E-field strength were higher in um, young, that are here in white, compared to older adults in gray um, in all configurations. Interestingly, in some configurations, older adults um, had lower focality values, meaning that maximum field strength were distributed over smaller areas. The, the stimulation was more focal in older adults. Field strength within target voice were higher in young <coughs> adults and comparable in all configurations. Field strength is highly correlated between electrode configurations, suggesting that similar factors may influence induced current on the level of the cortex for different configurations, and um, probably similar mechanisms underlie the effects of TDCS, irrespective of electrode location. Focality values seem to be rather independent between electrode configurations in both groups. And um, importantly, we were further interested in the impact of head and brain volume on e-field strength and found that in particular total head volume uh, and especially skull and skin and CSF volumes contributed to e-field strength. In addition, there was an interaction um, with age group, meaning that the relationship between e-field strength and head volume and CSF volume was weaker in um, older adults compared to young adults. So we can extract general e-field strength, e-field within voice and focality values as um, parameters from e-field simulation that vary between individuals and groups. General e-field strengths can be defined as 
fifth percentile or also as 19th percentile of maximum field values. We can average E field within ROI given that we know or can actually define the target in uh, these kind of TDCS setups. Importantly, all collations with uh, anatomical factors were similar regardless of which exact parameter we used. Though it might be useful to take global volumes uh, of the brain, but also of the head into account. Some studies, for instance, um, provide um, results for non-significant root differences in VBM as proof of no differences in anatomy, but still head size differences could affect the magnitude of response. Also, I think it is important to visualize the distribution over groups of subjects, for instance, in different stimulation intervention groups and to visualize distributions for different patient cohorts, for example. Okay, so um, if we uh, were able to acquire appropriate structural MR images in our clinical study, we can then use this information to explore relationships between e-fields and responsiveness to stimulation. Um, we did so in the first study I showed you in the beginning here, um, the individual effect of a nodal TDCS on GABA levels was positively correlated with E-field strength within the precentral gyrus. That means that the higher the individual reduction actually of um, GABA in a nodal compared to sham condition, the higher the um, E-field in the target ROI. We also observed this link uh, for the normal component, which um, includes the directional information of current flow. And for functional connectivity, we also observed a small positive um, relationships suggesting that increased individual difference in sensory motor network strength um, correlated uh, with the um, E field in the target. In the clinical study to investigate um, the effects of TDCS assisted uh, cognitive training, we also were able to do the field simulations here, general E fields, but not um, actually E fields within ROIs were positively um, associated with the difference in NBAC task, where we also observed the, um, the group effects. So the higher the improvement uh, in this near transfer task, the higher or the higher the electric field, the higher the improvement in um, the near transfer task. Um, and uh, this was uh, obviously not uh, seen in the sharing group. Um, yeah, so it seems sometimes a little trivial, but I think especially here, but also in all kinds of analysis, of course, we have to look at individual data. Um, this helps to identify data quality issues, of course, but also um, visualize how different brains and the distribution of current flow actually are. And uh, there are the participants, uh, these are the participants of the clinical study I just presented. And looking at these images may just further convince also that in clinical neuroscience um, adjustment uh, for individual head and brain anatomy uh, may be required, or at least may improve some kind of um, uh, test effects. Okay, so finally, uh, we did a modeling study to describe a proxy measure for head volume, namely a head circum circumference, which can easily be measured and used to estimate electric field strength when MR images are not present, for instance, in clinical studies. Um, to establish this uh, link between head circumference and E field strength, we simulated different electrode configurations. Here you can see the average over 47 subjects. We also included a few more uh, that I uh, did not show, uh, did not put here on the slide, and we performed a whole range of control analysis. But what we observed uh, was an inverse relationship between head circumference and uh, um, the induced E-field strengths. We extracted the equations from our modeling approach that also allow recalculation of E-field um, for a given head circumference. And this link may 
uh, now allow retrospective analysis from data to examine if probably head size of participants explain some effect or the absence of an effect. Or in the next step, um, also prospective planning maybe of stimulation intensities based on individual head sizes. This is a potential approach that requires further research, of course. Okay, and um, with that, uh, I want to thank all my colleagues and collaborators and you for your attention.